Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds at the George Washington University Hospital. This is our first stroke lecture of 2014, starting a new series of stroke sharing throughout our hospital and our DC community. Uh, we hope to improve stroke education in our community, um, not only to our physicians, but also to our nurses, techs, and anyone in need of stroke-specific education. So to kick off our series, I welcome Dr. Nurses Sinosian, who's the Associate Director of Stroke at the University of Southern California, and he will talk to us today about EMS routing protocols and some pre-hospital stroke protocols. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, today we're going to talk about the earliest uh, uh, time periods of stroke. Uh, we as neurologists respond to uh, code strokes in the emergency room, but there's a lot that goes on before we initially as physicians see the patient. So today, we're gonna to go over some of those aspects. So I'm gonna introduce the idea of pre-hospital stroke care. Uh, then we're gonna go over stroke systems of care because this is one area which has been revolutionized and has really come a long way in the past 10 or 15 years. We'll talk about the three main uh, caveats or main, three main sections within pre-hospital stroke care, identification of stroke. Because um, the real question is, um, how do we know before someone arrives to the hospital what is a stroke and what is not a stroke? We'll talk about tools, and we'll talk about how individuals who are not physicians can identify stroke patients. We'll talk about this idea of treatment. Is pre-hospital stroke treatment a possibility? Can we offer anything therapeutic to a patient on the way to the hospital in the ambulance? Or are we obligated to wait until a patient has been assessed in the emergency room to start treatment. And I'll tell you a bit about the research that I've been involved with and what the future looks like. And also uh, this idea of delivery, getting the patient to the correct hospital. Because not all hospitals have the abilities and capabilities to treat stroke. Uh, we'll talk about some pre-hospital research and a little bit about system-wide improvements. So I'm gonna put a slide up here on an idealized model of acute ischemic stroke care. This doesn't exist, but this is the direction we're moving into. And you see, I'm gonna start from the upper left. The idea is a patient has symptoms, and the most important step, they recognize their symptoms, they call 911. Without patient education and without community education, you can't look at and you can't uh, promulgate, you cannot have this stroke system of care. What happens when 911 is, is called is EMS is dispatched, the correct ambulance arrives at the, at the patient's home, uh, they do an assessment and then they transport that patient to a primary stroke center. In this country, there are over 900 uh, Joint Commission certified and over 1,000 stroke centers. Um, in addition, there are, is, is a next level. We'll talk about that in a second. But primary stroke centers are there to assess stroke patients very rapidly and do imaging. Imaging with uh, most often non-contrast CT scan. And primary stroke centers are there to deliver TPA in a timely manner. Does anyone know how many minutes, let me ask the residents, according to the American Heart Association and Brain Attack Coalition guidelines, how long should one uh, uh, take from arrival of the patient in the emergency room to treatment TPA? Less than 60. Less than 60, yeah, that's the ideal. However, there's also a second layer. There are gonna be certain individuals who have devastating strokes or large strokes that are unlikely to respond. And in those, there's a, a, a second layer which is being built upon this primary stroke center uh, system. This is the comprehensive stroke center network. And in these comprehensive stroke centers, there's multimodal imaging which is available. There's availability of catheter-based interventions uh, and also uh, not just a stroke unit, but also neurointensive care units. So you see, uh, this is the idealized model of stroke care. We're gonna focus really on the, f the, the uh, first few parts of this. And I'm putting up here the stroke chain of survival. This is what the uh, EMS community uses when they're teaching about stroke. And you see it there, I'm not gonna read through it. But just to, to a couple of things, detection, early recognition. And this is probably the most important thing about stroke care is having patients recognize their own symptoms as being a stroke and activate uh, EMS. So how do we educate the public about stroke? How do we get them to realize that calling 911 is, uh, um, uh, is the next step and the time is of the essence? Well, certainly um, we can educate the, the patients about something, some, something as simple as, as FAST. FAST is a simple tool that goes, F is for face, unilateral face weakness, A is for arm, you know, arm weakness or, or, or drift, 
S is for speech, speech abnormality, and T is for time. And that's been a very important um, message, this fast message that both the American Heart Association and the National Stroke Association have been uh, educating. Um, 91 is universally available, certainly in Washington, D.C., and through most parts of the United States. And uh, um, there's a lot of EMS education that comes along with this as well. And we'll go through some of that. Uh, public education and stroke, you see a lot of different organizations and uh, a lot of information that's out there. You may or may not know this, however, a stroke patient who calls 911 is seen an average of 84 minutes after their stroke symptoms. However, a stroke uh, patient that calls their personal physician is seen an average of 270 minutes after symptom onset. So it's very important to educate stroke patients that they should not call their physician, they should not call a friend, they shouldn't call the hospital directly, they should just call 911 immediately. So let's talk about identification of stroke. Well, certainly the 911 call operator has to screen that patient on the phone as a potential stroke and dispatch the correct ambulance. In Los Angeles, there's two different tiers of ambulance. There is a basic life support ambulance and the advanced uh, cardiac life support ambulance. And stroke falls into the more advanced cardiac life support uh, uh, dispatch. So dispatchers have to be educated and make the right call. And as far as the EMS, once they're on scene, they have to use a validated pre-hospital stroke screen. What happens is you don't leave it up to paramedics to make uh, independent determination of is the person having a stroke or not. They can certainly use their skill and knowledge, but you want to apply something that's very standard to every single patient they encounter. And this idea of scoop and go, if they suspect a stroke, not to delay, not to spend an, a, a, a lot of time on scene, get the basic information and go. So I'm going to go through some of the uh, 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 different stroke screens that are out there. These are stroke screens not for physicians. These are stroke screens for paramedics assessing patients in the field. The most common one that's used throughout this country is the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke screen. And what is this very uh, uh, similar to that we just talked about? Uh, different than the stroke scale, not an NIH stroke scale, but more like the FAST, very similar to the FAST which we use to educate non uh, EMS providers about stroke. It's facial droop, arm drift, abnormal speech. If any of those are positive, you score positive on the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke screen and you get delivered as a stroke. Now, what we use in Los Angeles is the Los Angeles pre-hospital stroke screen. It's a much more complex screen. Just want to go through it and this is what paramedics uh, uh, use. And on the right I have a a sheet from a, a, a study that we did where we enrolled people based on the Los Angeles pre-hospital stroke screen. You see there's some history there and the historical items are to increase the sensitivity and specificity of the stroke screen. It's mandated that all uh, paramedics obtain a uh, onset and duration of symptom time. Uh, age is a part of it, a history of seizure disorder and baseline functional status so that people who have seizure disorders, people who have poor baseline functional status do not screen positive and are not routed. Um, people who are uh, severely amended in nursing homes don't qualify for this routing and people who have a history of seizures don't. This is only because these items have been shown to improve the sensitivity and specificity. And also there's an age limit of 40 uh, to 95. That, that age limit also helps make this more sensitive and specific. The interesting thing about the Los Angeles pre-hospital stroke screen is it has a, a, a built into it a stroke severity screen. There's three exam items. If the, it, and you see the three exact the exam items listed over here in this section over here. So if there is facial weakness or facial droop, that scores one point. If there is an arm drift, that's one point. If the arm is completely dead, that gets you two points. And if there's grip is weak but present, it's one point. And if the hand is completely dead, it's two points. So you see, you get a zero to five uh, uh, a number on severity. And this is the only tool we have available to us to, to measure stroke severity in the field. The paramedics cannot do an NIH stroke scale. They just don't have the time, skill, and training to do it. We all can do it, and paramedics probably could do it, but th you know, stroke is one part of what they do. So we cannot uh, really go th through the process of having paramedics do the NIH stroke uh, scale training. So this is what we used. And there's a finger stick blood glucose item, and in the Los Angeles Pre-Hospital Stroke Screen, if the sugar is very low or very high, they're not considered a stroke and they're transported as non-stroke. Uh, I had one of my students look up stroke systems of care in California, and we're doing this nationwide as well. 
So in California, we have 33 local EMS agencies that serve 58 counties, and 15 of them have stroke routing protocols. And in the nation, what we'll find is over half of the population now lives in a jurisdiction or a location where there's stroke routing. What I mean by stroke routing is this, is that paramedics screen for stroke and then transport not to the closest hospital, but to a designated stroke center. These stroke routing protocols are extremely variable. For example, in Los Angeles, routing only occurs when symptoms have occurred two hours or less from when the paramedics are on scene. And the reason for that is between routing, evaluation, and treatment, it's going to take over an hour. So, uh, and everyone knows TPA is approved for use in the first three hours after symptom onset. So the routing protocol is two hours. Now, we were in, in, in uh, discussions with LAEMS to change it to three and a half hours if TPA got FDA approved for use up to four and a half hours. But as you know, the FDA did not give TPA that indication. So in LA County, two hours is the limit for routing. After two hours, patients go to their nearest hospital, not the nearest stroke center. And you see the different protocols. There was a median of three hours and a range of between two to eight hours of, of, for routing. So I don't know what the protocols here are in, in DC, but there's going to be a certain number of time. If you had a stroke 24 hours ago, you're not going to qualify for pre-hospital stroke routing. You're going to go to uh, the regular route and go to your nearest hospital. Um, eight protocols said that you cannot route if it takes more than 30 minutes extra to get to the stroke center hospital. And also, a lot of these routing protocols have things built in that if a patient is unstable, having an MI or something else, then you route to the closest hospital. Uh, they're, they're variable, all these protocols. Um, and the identif identification tool that's used in the vast majority, as you see down here, is the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Screen, or the FAST. Uh, here's a, a, a study we did looking at EMS routing of stroke, looking at a color code of how different states have come online with our routing protocols. We use the nationwide inpatient sample, which is a, uh, a large repository of admission information. And we found that the, in 2010, uh, there was a threshold where most stroke admissions occurred in a jurisdiction where there was stroke routing. And since then, even more states have come on the line. So I'd say is stroke routing is now the norm. EMS is now very much in the business of identifying stroke using a different stroke screening method and delivering that individual not to the closest hospital, but closest stroke center. Now, in Los Angeles, uh, if you are a primary stroke center designated by the Joint Commission, the DNV, or any other uh, uh, commissioning body, you are eligible. In New York State, for example, it's done by a, a state organization. New York State will designate who is and who is not a stroke center and will keep that, uh, 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 that designation. So every jurisdiction is going to be different. One thing we also noted was that hospitals need a little bit of motivation to become primary stroke centers. We know that there's better outcomes in primary stroke centers. We know that primary stroke centers have uh, uh, processes built into them that patients get evaluated much faster and more rapidly. However, many hospitals were not terribly motivated to be stroke centers. But what we found was as um, counties and states chose to implement EMS stroke routing, we saw a greater proportion of hospitals that were eligible become stroke centers. When we looked at uh, uh, all of California, we looked at um, the years, um, we looked at zero as the uh, time when the county adopted stroke routing, and we looked at the conversion rate, which is the rate of all possible hospitals that could be stroke centers and then the ones that year that became stroke centers, we found that as a county adopted stroke routing protocols, the hospitals became primary stroke centers. So one of the main drivers to this explosion of primary stroke centers is the implementation of EMS stroke routing. Now, we have a problem with Los, in Los Angeles. We have 65 hospitals that have 24-hour emergency rooms. And uh, actually, I think I have this on the next slide. So this is what LA looked like in January of 2005 as far as prim primary stroke centers. You guys see a single star? Anyone want to take a guess where that is? Which hospital? It's in Westwood. That's UCLA Medical, Medical Center. And you say stroke center is one of the, uh, 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 that's where I train. It's a very, very uh, prominent, very uh, prolific stroke center. And in 2005, they were the only joint commission primary stroke center. 
Now, in Los Angeles County, in November 2009, we made the determination that patients were going to start being routed. And we instantly found another seven, uh, um, a patient, seven, seven hospitals within uh, LA County, and these two down here within Orange County became primary stroke centers. And what happened is that number increased and then and, and kept increasing. But one thing that we found in LA is we found this big donut hole right in the center of LA. Anyone take a guess as to why we have a lack of primary stroke centers right in the center of LA? Take a guess. What is it about central LA which has kept stroke centers from being uh, formed there? It's, it's also known as South LA, South Central LA. It's really the uh, uh, most poverty stricken and, and, and most needy part of Los Angeles. So you see, hospitals to become stroke centers have to have a certain amount of resources. They need to have a certain uh, amount of will to be stroke centers. And unfortunately, because of the limitations on payer mix and other things in this area, a lot of hospitals decided they don't want ambulance traffic. They don't want stroke patients taken to them. So what happens is if you have a, a stroke in South LA, you're going to be transported a, a long ways, either to Cedar sinai Hospital up in Beverly Hills, which is interesting, going from uh, South LA all the way to Beverly Hills, or down to Long Beach Memorial Hospital, which is down in the South Bay area. But you see is the hospitals are all concentrated in the better and more affluent parts of town. And the other problem we have now is we have 33 primary stroke centers. So we have hospitals that have no business being primary stroke centers becoming primary stroke centers so that they don't lose out on business. So we have too many stroke centers in the nice parts of town. And what we find is that where we have a, a very excellent stroke center which serves the community well, the other community hospitals become stroke centers. All of a sudden those patients are being diverted to uh, ERs that don't have the same experience. And we feel like there's a cer certain threshold that we've met in LA and now we feel as though maybe the stroke care has somewhat uh, 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 either plateaued or slightly decreased. So you see, there is a, that is a two-edged sword. Once you build the stroke centers, hospitals want to become stroke centers. They want to get stroke traffic. But recall, the bar for being a primary stroke center is not very high. It's very medium. And not all stroke centers have a stroke-trained neurologist. Actually, many of them have ER docs who are running the program who are great physicians but they don't necessarily have that stroke expertise to run the stroke unit upstairs. They have the expertise to treat with TPA, but not, run to the stroke, not to run the stroke unit upstairs. Now, time is of the essence, and we know that in a typical acute ischemic stroke, every minute the brain loses 1.9 million neurons. And um, what we've learned is time is of the essence not just for ischemic stroke, but for cerebral hemorrhage. I'm going to show you some data that shows that about one-third of patients with intracerebral hemorrhage deteriorate by the time from when they're seen, when they're seen in the uh, field by paramedics to when they're assessed in the hospital by study nurses. One third of intracerebral hemorrhage patients when they present will deteriorate. So you see, really time is of the essence. So these, these EMS systems of care are very, very important. Getting the patients identified is important. Getting patients to the hospital very, very quickly is important. And then acting quickly in the emergency room is also very important. So again, we're talking about dispatch, delivery, and door. Uh, a lot of Ds there. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of these aspects. One of the other things is this, is, is you know, we're at the county hospital. So if someone were to um, walk into the hospital, they're going to be met with a long line of individuals. They're going to have to register. And we have not yet given TPA to anyone who actually walked into LA County USC Medical Center. However, if uh, you use the ambulance, you go straight into a bed. So I liken this to some of the residents might, might, might know what it's like when you're at the nightclub and there's the lineup outside and then there's the, the velvet rope and your name is on the list. You walk up there, you go right in. It's the same thing. If you're going to walk, you know, you got to tell stroke patients, if you're going to walk into the emergency room and you're going to register, it's going to take you a few hours. Uh, but if you call 911, you're going straight into a bed. It's almost like being the, the VIP, straight into the VIP room. Um, I'm sure some of the residents know that. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, uh, I remember when I was a, a resident in New York, I, I trained at the same place as uh, Dr. Berger, and uh, I definitely know the feeling of standing in line. Um, so again, we're talking about this model of acute ischemic stroke care. Using this model as it is right now, the earliest time where therapeutics can be delivered is right over here in the primary stroke center. However, there is an opportunity 
to treat patients in the ambulance because paramedics are healthcare providers and paramedics may be able to deliver stroke therapy. And that's what I want to talk about next. So stroke, as we know, every minute you're losing two million neurons. Um, we know that minutes matter and we know that it takes a certain amount of time to get from the patient's home into the emergency room to the CAT scanner and get TPA on board. So there's a very narrow uh, therapeutic time window because stroke needs to be treated in the first few hours. Uh, we also know that over half in some jurisdictions of stroke patients arrive by ambulance. So I think that the ambulance and the paramedics are in a unique position to do and to deliver stroke therapy. And this is a really interesting and new area of research. Now, if you want to do a trial in the field, you're going to want to choose something that is a uh, something that's safe, first and foremost. Next is you need to have a tool to diagnose stroke in the field. Now, we have the Los Angeles Prehospital Stroke Screen, which I mentioned was more sensitive and specific than the Cincinnati Prehospital Stroke Screen, although it takes a bit longer to do. You need, a, I think, a, a stroke rating, uh, something that wrote to rate the stroke severity, and the LAMS is the Los Angeles Motor Score that's built into the LA uh, Prehospital Stroke Screen. That's the 0 to 5 score. Well, you need to elicit consent. Paramedics cannot obtain consent in the United States. They can in Europe. It's very easy to do pre-hospital trials in Europe because paramedics can obtain consent, and then once they're in the hospital, the consent can be reobtained. That's just not allowed in the United States, except in situations where patients are unable to provide consent. Now, in stroke, there will be times where a stroke patient cannot provide consent, but many times where they can, and a paramedic is not trained to do that assessment. So you see. That's one of the real challenges. So to do a clinical trial in the field, you need to find a way to elicit consent. And you need to do a randomization. So you can't have a very cumbersome thing where you call packet one, packet two. You need to actually have the uh, treatment pre-randomized, pre-encounter randomization, meaning some of the ambulance is carrying one, some of the ambulance is carrying another. You need to track all of that. This is a very, very complicated way to do research. Uh, however, we were able to get funding and have recently completed the Field Administration of Stroke Therapy Magnesium Phase three trial. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the study and just some background uh, and maybe a, a, a word of advice to our residents. I was a fellow in 2004. I was sitting in, a, in the fellow's room with my co-fellow, Dujan Kim, and uh, Dr. Saver, uh, my mentor, walked in and said, hey, either of you speak Spanish? I said, oh. I speak Spanish. I had uh, taken coursework in, uh, in the Bronx. I, I spoke a lot of Dominican and uh, Puerto Rican Spanish. Um, so I went with him, and, and, and he signed me up to be a FASMAG investigator. Actually, I was the lone Spanish-speaking FASMAG investigator. And uh, so in a way, this trial is, the, is what got me interested in research. This is kind of where I, I built up my interest in research. And uh, my advice to any of the residents is if you find someone who is doing a research project, stick to them and just uh, ride that project all the way to completion. That's one way to really uh, get into and get, a, get, get into research as a career as well. So I was fortunate enough to be involved in the study before the first uh, ever enrollment. So what is FASTMAG? FASTMAG is a placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized clinical trial. However, it's a very different study than what we're used to. Now, if you want to do a clinical trial, you go and ask uh, um, Columbia, Harvard, uh, um, Emory to participate in your clinical trial, and you have all these academic centers enrolling stroke patients in research. However, this is a single region trial, meaning 59 hospitals all in the Los Angeles and Orange County regions participating, and these are hospitals that are academic centers like UCLA and USC, and community hospitals like Mission Community Hospital that have never done research before. So you see, it's a regional study where you have a whole host of different hospitals doing uh, uh, participating. And, and this is very different than what we're used to. So to do something like this, you really need a team of nurses and administrators that are centrally located that drive out to these different hospitals and make sure the people in those hospitals know about the study, get ER docs enrolled as investigators in the study, because if you want to do a pre-hospital trial, you cannot send patients anywhere other than where they were destined to go. If you enroll a patient in a pre-hospital trial and you send them to one hospital versus the other, that other hospital is not going to allow it. So what we did is we concentrated in LA and Orange County. We got those hospitals up and running. We got them all signed up as being sites. And then 
patients went to their usual site of care hospital. In the ambulance, we obtained consent. I'll tell you how we did it. And they were randomized, patients were randomized to, gosh, uh, four grams of magnesium versus placebo in the field, followed by 16 grams of magnesium versus placebo at that hospital. And all the, 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 the treatment was pre-randomized so that there was a bag in each ambulance of either magnesium or placebo to, for them to hang in the field and a, one, a bigger one for them to pass on to the nurse at the hospital when they arrived. So you see, the study was pre-randomized. Patients were enrolled in the field to either magnesium or placebo. Uh, the last patient was enrolled 12-6-2012, um, so about a year ago. And we are going to be presenting the primary results at the International Stroke Conference, uh, which is going to be in about three weeks. I hope to see some of you there. Um, it's unfortunately embargoed, so I can't tell you right now if it's a positive or negative trial, but I can tell you everything else about the trial. Um, the primary endpoint is a rank and scale shift. Um, what that does is, does is it uses the whole seven points from zero to six of the Rankin to see if there's any difference in the distribution of Rankins in the active group versus the placebo group. Principal investigator Jeffrey Saver. The idea of neuroprotection, magnesium is not meant to reopen arteries. Magnesium is meant to freeze the penumbra. There are some properties of magnesium that are very beneficial. For example, we know that magnesium is a vasodilator. It helps improve blood flow to the brain. We know that magnesium antagonizes the NMDA channel, which is involved in excitotoxicity. And we know that magnesium prevents calcium entry into cells. So you see a lot of different uh, properties of magnesium which are going to be beneficial. Uh, we, also know that we also know that magnesium is safe. So anytime you're doing a study in the field, the first option you choose is something that's very safe. So again, we're doing a study where paramedics are administering a treatment in the field. We can't control what happens out there in the field. Uh, we can only control so much. I'll give you guys another uh, example from the study. We had a, a paramedic with a eclamptic patient call a ER and talk to a non-fast mag study investigator saying, we have someone here who is uh, eclamptic, can we give the magnesium? And that doctor, knowing nothing about the study, said, sure, go ahead and give it. So the paramedics attempted to use our study drug in a patient without any consent in a different condition. Thankfully, we were lucky they were not able to establish IV. So little things like that. So you can't control everything that happens in the field with the paramedics, despite how much we do some training. So you have to have a safe, a safe treatment. And we know that magnesium is safe. Um, we talked about uh, the, the area that we did the study, we had to train 3,300 paramedics, over 400 physician investigators, over 100 neurologists, neurosurgeons, and we use a simul ring system. Paramedics don't like to wait. Paramedics want to get you on the phone right away. And our old system where there was a daisy chain, they didn't like because, you know, you're in the shower, the other doctor's in the middle of a case, and so they're not going to wait for it to da daisy chain to the third person. So we did a simul ring. They call a certain number. It rings five investigators at the same time. First one that picks up is connected. And in that way, we were able to get the paramedics connected right away because the paramedics will not wait 10 seconds on the phone. They're just going to hang up and, and get their work done. So what happens? Well, this is a timeline of the study. There's onset of symptoms and activation of EMS. After EMS arrival, there's this period of time where they are uh, getting the patient to the gurney, getting information from other uh, local individuals establishing last known well, last known well time. And what we have is a cell phone conversation with a MD. Uh, the paramedics call that number, pass the phone either to the patient or the patient's surrogate. We obtain consent on the phone, and then there's initiation of the fast mag field dose if they give consent, transport to the nearest primary stroke center, there's ED triage, initiation of the hospital dose of fast mag, and then they're taken to the CAT scanner, CT results are uh, obtained, and then we have over here uh, assessment in the nurse, in the, by the nurse in the emergency room. So here's the population we enrolled. The average age was 69, and interestingly, the stroke subtype was ischemia, 73%, hemorrhage, 24%, and mimic, 3%. A couple of interesting points here. First is that there's a lot more intracerebral hemorrhage than we thought. Does anyone know, if you look at an unselected population from any hospital, what, per what percentage of strokes are usually intracerebral hemorrhage? About 15%. That's absolutely dead right. 24% in the study because we're looking at patients in the first two hours who activate EMS. And what we figured is that people with intracerebral hemorrhage have more severe neurologic deficits. They're more likely to be nauseated. They're more likely to have a headache. Therefore, more likely to activate 911. 
And the other thing is our mimic rate was 3%. And that's because of a two-tiered system where paramedics screen and then a physician is on the phone doing the enrollment. Now, in most clinical trials, a physician does uh, three or four enrollments in that trial. However, in this study, we had five enrolling physicians who enrolled anywhere between uh, 400, 50, 500 to 100 patients into the study. So I, I, I uh, got to enroll about 400 patients in the study. I fielded about 1,200 calls. Um, it was a, for the uh, <clears throat> 10 years of the study, I carried that phone everywhere with me. I actually did an enrollment once in Estonia when I was traveling on my way to the European Stroke Conference. All you need to do enrollment is a phone and internet connection to do the uh, computer uh, database entry. So we were doing enrollments everywhere whenever we could. It was a really, it became a part of our life, this study. So you see um, TPA 29% overall, but 40% of the ischemic stroke uh, uh, that were within that time window. So that 29% is for TPA, for, for TIA and stroke. If you take out the TIAs, it comes up to 40%. And you look at the NI stroke scale at hospital arrival, it's about nine, and uh, uh, LA motor score is about four. Now, if someone tell me what time it is. I just want to end on time. I don't want to go over. 43, okay, great. So the key to treatment intervals. Well, the onset of stroke symptom to treatment was 46 minutes in this trial, 46 minutes. The next fastest trial probably was some, uh, the NINDS TPA trial with a median treatment time twice as long. So a lot of people ask the question, why give magnesium in the field? Why not give it in hospital arrival? Well, really, it's very hard to do any clinical trial on hospital arrival, and the reason is this, is when a stroke patient arrives in the hospital within two hours of symptom onset, the focus is on giving TPA, and you don't want to take anything away from that focus. They are getting uh, evaluated. They're going straight to the CAT scanner. CAT scan is being reviewed. We are going to give what, we're going to, TPA is going to be administered. There's no time to pain consent. There's no time to add any additional therapy on top of that. We learned that from a host of other neuroprotective trials. So if you enroll someone in the field and you have the agent on board as they arrive, that is the best way to get treatment on board early and not interfere with the TPA uh, decision. And you see here, a 46 minute median time is pretty impressive uh, throughout the entire study. Here's the NINDS TPA trial looking at different treatment intervals compared to FASTMAG. And you see, this is really uh, one of the only studies that treat patients in that zero to one hour golden hour of, uh, 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 of stroke therapy. So um, there's nothing else to compare in that time. There's, there's no other study that's ever been given in the first hour of stroke. And if you compare FASTMAG to other neuroprotective uh, trials, here's one looking at magnesium as a neuroprotective. You see that um, it is also very, very difficult to treat patients in that zero to uh, uh, one hour window, that golden uh, hour. 75% of FASTMAG patients, 0% in images, and that mirrors the other neuroprotective trials. So really, it was a, a, a pretty exciting study to be a part of, and uh, we are very excited to present the results. Regardless if it's positive or negative, I think this opens a new window into pre-hospital therapy, a new possibility of treating in the first hour, and whether or not magnesium is beneficial in freezing the penumbra and being a neuroprotectant. We think that this model works. We think getting paramedics engaged works. We think that we can do pre-hospital stroke research in the future. And so the, the next question is not if we'll do pre-hospital research again, but what the next study will be. A lot of innovations with FASTMAG, but I'm just going to draw attention to the first one, which is the first golden hour stroke treatment trial. Hasn't been anything else to be given in stroke for the first hour. So uh, very excited to be a part of this team and uh, uh, to be presenting uh, uh, some, re some of this research at the upcoming stroke meeting. But we also learned a few things with FASTMAG. One thing we learned is a lot about hyperacute intracerebral hemorrhage. A lot of times you guys get called for intracerebral hemorrhage in the emergency room, that patient is comatose and posturing. Well, that patient was not comatose and posturing often when the paramedics were on scene. Often they're awake, alert, slurring their speech, complaining of headache. I can tell you a few times I've had a conversation with a patient enrolling him into this trial where they're complaining of a headache, they're slurring their speech, they give me consent, and that's the last conversation they ever have because the hemorrhage continues to expand and they go on and die. So there's a lot that goes on in that first hour of hemorrhage that we haven't really explored, okay? I'm gonna talk about that a little bit as well. Also the idea of enrolling underrepresented populations. By enrolling in the field, we're able to get 26, 27% Latino and about 11% African-American enrollments. 
Though that's much, much harder in the hospital. I, know what the, I don't know what there is, but there is a real bias, I think, towards enrolling underserved populations in the field. And you can overcome some of that by enrolling uh, 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 in the field rather than in the hospital. Also, this idea of low rates of mimic. When you have a physician on the phone doing an enrollment, they can pick up a lot of things that paramedics uh, might have missed. And that combination of paramedic screen plus physician screen leads to very low mimic rates. And what we find is that if you do a pre-hospital study, you still have high rates of TPA utilization. The two kind of don't interfere with each other. I'm just going to um, have a couple of points here. One thing is, um, what one, th one thing we learned is that individuals who came in with intracerebral hemorrhage and their hemorrhage expanded, their blood pressure was higher than those in which there was no blood uh, expansion, but it was only higher for the first hour, and then it, the two kind of came together. So this idea that high blood pressure only really matters in the first hour when you talk about hemorrhage expansion. That intracerebral hemorrhage is going to have go through a phase of expansion, and then it's going to stop. And most of that expansion, as we know, goes on the first hour. That's what we found in this uh, um, uh, sub-study of FASTMAG. Also, we realized that 30% of patients with intracerebral hemorrhage deteriorate by the time the nurse sees them in the emergency room. So the paramedics do a Glasgow coma scale. They come to the hospital, they get a CAT scan, and the nurses do a Glasgow coma scale. 30% of the time, it's two points or more worse. And the other thing is this. If you look at the median Glasgow coma scale in those that deteriorate, in the field, it was a 15. In the emergency room, it was a 3. So when they deteriorate, they don't go from a Glasgow coma scale of 15 to 13. They go from a 15 to 3. So there's a population of people here, 30% of these hemorrhages, that's deteriorating en route to the hospital because you're catching them so early that hemorrhage is expanding. So you see there's a lot that we're learning by looking at this earliest time window. So let's talk about the future of pre-hospital treatment. Is it possible to do thrombolysis in the ambulance? What do you guys think? Is it possible to give TPA to a stroke patient in the ambulance? That's a, that's a good question. We'll, we'll address that. I will also talk about, is it possible to lower blood pressure in the ambulance? That, that, that yes. The answer is yes, and I'll show you some research that's being done on that. The other idea is pre-hospital cooling. Certainly is a possibility. Other pre-hospital neuroprotection. There's a study that's, that's launching in Toronto. And pre-hospital ischemic preconditioning. Very interesting. You, you inflate a blood pressure cuff, five minutes, and you deflate it. Inflate it, deflate it. Very nice uh, 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 model that that somehow releases some factors that are neuroprotective. So you see, there's a lot of things that paramedics can do, and we've got to test all of these things to see if it works. Now, you can give pre-hospital thrombolysis. However, you need a CAT scanner in your, in your ambulance. And in Berlin, they have the STEMO uh, ambulance. They have two of them, and the CAT scanner and the neurologist are in the ambulance. It's very different in Europe. The uh, uh, doctors often go for a ride along with the paramedics. And if you have a neurologist and you have a CAT scanner, you can actually give TPA in the ambulance 20 minutes faster than you can in, you know, in the hospital. Um, in Houston, they just bought one of these. And Jim Grotta is going to try and do a pre-hospital uh, TPA treatment. And in Edmonton, they just bought one of these as well. So um, the future may be, if you have a stroke, they dispatch this ambulance, where they do a CAT scanner in the field and treat with TPA. Um, and maybe the stroke fellows will uh, do ride-alongs. I, I, that may be the future of, of uh, stroke care. I don't know. Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to wait and see. The other thing is the right study. This is a study that was done in Europe looking at glycerol trinitrate, or, or nitroglycerin. We all know nitroglycerin. It's been around for ages. It's a it can be given transdermally, which is really great for paramedics in the field. And what they did is, stud is a study where they randomized individuals to either nitroglycerin or placebo patch. And what they found is the blood pressure was lower in the nitroglycerin group compared to the placebo patch group. And at two hours, that was sustained. So what this group found is that you can actually lower blood pressure in the field in individuals who, are, who have nitroglycerin patches. This group also showed, however, that nitroglycerin, although it lowers blood pressure, it does not lower cerebral blood flow by doing a, 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 a PET studies looking at blood flow into the brain. So you can lower blood pressure in the field by giving a patch. And interestingly, you get a headache with uh, gl glycerotinitrate or nitroglycerin 
But if you look at their modified Rankin scale, those who got treated, at least in this small study, <clears throat> did better than those who got placebo. This is a very, very small study. Um, but what they, what, what they were able to do whoops, is they were able to show that uh, in, in two different studies, the Wright study and the PillFast study, which is a pre-hospital study of lisinopril, you can actually lower blood pressure, lower blood pressure with active treatment in the field compared to placebo. So here are two studies that show differences of blood pressure. Interestingly, the nitroglycerin had a much greater effect on blood pressure than did the, the sublingual uh, uh, lisinopril. So I'm uh, uh, very excited about the FAST BP study. This is the, uh, uh, a blood pressure lowering trial in the field. Um, I'm leading it along with a couple of co-investigators and my mentor uh, from FASTMAT called FAST BP. What we're doing is taking patients with severely elevated blood pressure in the field and treating them with nitroglycerin patch. So paramedics encounter a patient in the field with very high blood pressure, and they call us on the phone, we randomize them to treatment or placebo, and then we transport them to their nearest hospital for regular care. Now you ask the question, why 180? Well, if you have an ischemic stroke and your blood pressure is elevated, you need to lower it below 180 to give TPA. If you have a hemorrhagic stroke, lowering blood pressure may actually prevent hemorrhage expansion. So in this study, we are going to be lowering blood pressure in patients with stroke and very elevated blood pressure. We've enrolled four patients to date. We're trying to get to 45. Like all studies, it's very, very hard to recruit these patients. And um, this is essentially the model that we're using, this idea that if you look at volume of hematoma on this axis and time on this axis, the volume of hematoma is going to increase up to a certain point where it's going to kind of stop increasing. And if we can get treatment on board earlier, we might be able to prevent that hematoma expansion in that first hour and therefore have better outcomes. First two hours, very elevated blood pressure, nitroglycerin. Those of you who are concerned about nitroglycerin, you should be aware there was a large 4,000 patient study of nitroglycerin started in the, uh, in, in the emergency rooms in, throughout Europe called the ENO study, efficacy of nitric oxide and stroke. We're waiting for the results of that study, but we know that nitroglycerin is safe in stroke patients. And now the question is, can we have paramedics using transdermal nitroglycerin and, uh, in, in, in stroke patients? Here's some uh, data showing that this is before and after nitroglycerin is, a, a, uh, is applied in ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, showing that cerebral blood flow may actually increase. So I'm just going to, um, that's what it looks like, the patch. So. I think uh, I want to kind of rack, wrap, wrap things up right now um, with one point, okay? We, we did a, we, 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 uh, being a primary stroke center makes a huge difference in outcomes. We know that stroke centers are better than non-stroke center, but, but we wanted to ask this question. Is a hospital that becomes a primary stroke center just a better hospital to begin with? Are those hospitals that become stroke centers uh, places where care is better in general than in a hospital that will never be a stroke center? Or is there something about the certification process which elevates the care of that hospital? So we looked at this in the FASTMAG study, and we found that 31% were enrolled in primary stroke centers before, or in hospitals that were not primary stroke centers that were going to go on to be stroke centers, okay? So let's keep that in mind. A third are in hospitals that are currently not primary stroke centers, but are going to become primary stroke centers. Half are enrolled at primary stroke centers, and 20% in hospitals that are never going to be stroke centers. Never. What we found is that when we look at uh, ED to scan time, the pre-primary stroke centers and the non-stroke centers were about the same, whereas the primary stroke centers had much lower ED to scan time. If you look at TPA use in ischemic stroke, again, the pre and the non, very, very different where the stroke centers used higher rates, and the door to needle times, again, you see are much better. So being a primary stroke center does actually improve care and does uh, lead to improved uh, uh, TPA utilization and uh, a thorough put in the uh, emergency room. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that establishing stroke systems of care makes a big difference. Pre-hospital care is vital. Uh, we need to identify stroke at the earliest possible time points, we need to decrease delays and transport them to the right place. By being a, a certified primary stroke center, 
these hospitals are providing a better level of stroke care. And I think that having as many primary stroke centers as possible in the community is the first step. The next step is to form networks between those primary stroke centers and stroke centers like George Washington Hospital where they can administer TPA there, screen them, and then send the uh, most uh, devastating and the most uh, interesting cases over here. Um, I believe that pre-hospital treatment is the future. There's a lot of pre-hospital stroke trials that are ongoing. Uh, I'm very engaged in this, and, and I can give anyone additional information if they want later on. I don't want to uh, belabor the point going through all the pre-hospital stroke trials, but we are doing the FAST BP trial right now to lower blood pressure in the field. I think that getting to those patients in that first hour is going to make a big difference. And we know that organized systems of stroke care have improved care in Los Angeles, and, is, and, and we presume that improvement has occurred uh, throughout the country as well. I wanted to thank you all for your attention and for the invitation. It was a pleasure being here, and uh, uh, thank you again. Thank you, nurses. Do we have any questions? Hi. Um, great talk. I'm one of the uh, PGY3 neurology residents. Um, just a quick question about the um, pre-hospital evaluation by EMS. Have you ever experienced a discrepancy between the EMS pre-hospital evaluation versus the physician who evaluates the patient in the ER? So, uh, and what I mean is, sometimes when we evaluate stroke cases down here, uh, the time of onset or last known normal by the EMS is sometimes different than what the physicians get in the ER, and so that kind of, well, take patients out of the TPA time window. Um, and if there's a discrepancy, my second question is, would it be, uh, I don't know if wise is the right uh, word to use here, but um, is it a good thing to lower the blood pressure that acutely if they're not a candidate for a TPA uh, thrombolysis? So very good question. I'll answer the first one. I actually have personal experience with uh, the first question. Paramedic obtained last on a while time is never as efficient as a, a, a uh, physician obtained. And I'll tell you that in the FASTMAG study, we were always on the phone with the patient or the surrogate uh, reobtaining the last known well time. So there were a lot of times where we didn't enroll patients that the paramedics called us for because the last known well time was actually not correct. However, we don't have the experience of what you're describing because since we screened everyone on the phone, when they came into the hospital, the, the times matched up pretty well. If you're going to lower blood pressure in the field, you can't do it in everyone. You have to select a group of people who you think will benefit. When we did the FAST BP study, we selected blood pressure 180 and above because we, need, we, th we can think of a rationale for both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, and we came up with a, with a medication we thought was safe. I would not lower blood pressure in the field using any kind of a medicine which has a, a very immediate effect or, or an exaggerated effect. The thing about transdermal nitroglycerin is because it's transdermal, it kind of seeps in. And the paramedics are constantly checking blood pressure. And if that blood pressure is getting too low, they can take the patch off and wipe off the skin. Um, are we going to hurt people by giving uh, antihypertensives in this time window? It's possible. That's what we're doing in the research study. It's possible. We don't think so, but we've been wrong so many times in stroke. I certainly don't presume to know. Yes, question in the back. Hi, Aviva Ellenstein, one of our movement disorder faculty. I'm curious, uh, given the discrepancy in the TPA rate between the three sites, whether you think you'll have enough power within your primary stroke center to pull out an effect of magnesium that may be distinct from the others. I imagine even the power analysis for the study must have been hard to set up since there's not really much to compare it to. Yeah, you ask a very good question. The, the power analysis was based on an 8% difference uh, between the, the rank and distribution between the magnesium and the placebo group. And that's how we arrived at the number. Uh, initially, the study was, was going to be 1,300, but because we were enrolling far less uh, ischemic strokes than intracerebral hemorrhage, the DSMB met and said, you're not going to meet your power analysis with 1,300. Increase it to 1,700 so you can enroll this, the, the correct number of ischemic strokes. So we're assuming an 8% difference in the distribution, uh, and that's what the study's powered for. Magnesium is not going to have a very powerful effect one way or the other because it really is supposed to be a, a, a um, neuroprotectant. Within the study, what we found is there were 480 TPA cases, hopefully randomized 50-50 out of 1,700. So that's a subset that we can look at. 
but we were assuming that if there's any benefit of magnesium, we don't know how that'll interact with TPA. It could be that magnesium freezes the penumbra and then TPA restores blood flow and they have a better outcome, or it could be that the effect of TPA is so large that it'll overshower, o o overpower the potential effect of magnesium. That's stuff we're gonna have to look at with the data, and uh, um, I don't know what we're gonna find. Hopefully, hopefully we can find a benefit in that subgroup as well. Thank you. All right, thank you.